He is our friend indeed. God is our friend. Tonight, we're going to be addressing a very key topic from scriptures. Righteousness by by faith. Righteousness by faith. And I pray that as we respond to this uh, presentation, that the Holy Spirit, that is always at work, whenever God's word is open, will be at work in your heart and in your life. But before I do the presentation, I just want to make a very special announcement. A very, very special announcement. An announcement you have been waiting to hear. Last evening, we had a topic presentation. What was our presentation last evening? Who remembers? Anybody remember what we talked about last evening? What was that? The Sabbath. We talked about the Sabbath last evening. Am I right? Yes, even the quiz reminded us that's what we talked about. We talked about the Sabbath last evening. We talked about how God began the Sabbath right at creation. After the first week, six days, the closed that first week of creation, he made a Sabbath blessed holiday. And then we finally talked about how even in the new heaven and the new earth, the Bible says from one Sabbath to another, all flesh, shall come up to praise before God. Wouldn't you like to be there when all flesh is praising God on a Sabbath in the new heaven and the new earth? Amen. And as the quiz master said, that's why we need to practice from now. So this coming Sabbath, we're going to be having a very special Sabbath celebration right in the church hall, in the sanctuary, this coming Sabbath. And you are invited you're invited with your families. You're invited with your friends. You're invited with everybody. And I'm going to encourage you to come early so that you can make sure that you're seated, you're blessed, and you're at a place where you can get everything that God has in store for you. The text says, come taste and see that God is good. And so we're looking forward to come taste and see that God is good. So here's what you will do for me. Because last evening as I talked about and presented the Sabbath... You remember I said that the Sabbath is like your date night with God. You remember? I talked about maybe you have, you, you're in a relationship with a spouse. And, and because sometimes you're so busy, one of you working at this part of uh, 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 Houston and the other one working at another part of Houston. And sometimes you're like two ships sailing past each other in the night. You barely have time to spend with each other. So you put a date night together. So you know what? This is the time we spend together. The Sabbath is like that for us. It's like a date with God. Isn't that wonderful? Don't you want to have a date with God? That's what the Sabbath is. So, here is what I'm going to ask you to do. Make every plan this week to be a part of that date experience with God. So if you plan to go travel, put it off. If you plan to die, put it off. <laughs> if you plan to get sick, put it off. If you plan not to be here, put it off. Let's make sure by the grace of God we are all here together because God is going to meet us here and we're going to have a good time worshiping God. So I'm looking forward to seeing you. And I know that God is looking forward to seeing you. And together we're going to have a good time in worship. Lunch will be provided. A fellowship luncheon will be provided. So don't even worry about that. You know, so... You don't need to go shopping. You don't need to go any sporting. You don't need to go swimming. You just need to come swim in the love of Jesus Christ. And I'm sure that when you leave here, you will know that, man, this has been a blessing to me. God is looking forward to us all here being together. This coming Saturday morning, the seventh day of the week, the Bible calls it a Sabbath. This will be June 3 already. I think the year just started. It will be June, the 3rd of June. We will be here. And I'm looking forward to the opportunity to be here with you. Our message for tonight is righteousness by what? Faith. I invite you to bow your heads. And as we, uh, before we open the scriptures, we must always pray. So before we open the scriptures tonight, we're going to pray asking God to bless us. Father, we thank you. We love you. We know you love us. We pray that your Holy Spirit 
would now guide us as we open your words and open the scripture that you would speak to our hearts, that your word would be a lamp to guide us in this dark world and a light to show us where we ought to go to serve you. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone say, Amen. 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 Righteousness by faith. Before I address the topic, tomorrow evening, this will be our topic. A brand new you. Would you like to be a brand new you? Yeah, a brand new you. God can make you over. Would you like God to make you over? Or are you happy with yourself? Okay, we, we all wish we could have been a little better. You know, sometimes we spend so much time looking in the mirror. Man, I wish I were, I wish I had, I, you know. But God is the one who will do that. So tomorrow evening, our topic, a brand new you. But for this evening, the topic that we will address is the topic that is uh, entitled uh, Righteousness by Faith. Anybody knows this couple? Who is it? Prince William and, Ka and Catherine, or Kate, Duchess of Cambridge. A few years ago, the whole world almost waited with bated breath to get the latest news about the birth of the son of Prince William and Kate. Everybody was waiting. She was pregnant. I mean, some of you had gone to the wedding on your TV about 3 o'clock in the morning. You know, well, I was in my bed sleeping. Like I tell people, they didn't come to my wedding. Why should I go to theirs? I mean, I'm just as important as they are, aren't I? All right. But everybody was waiting for the birth of their baby. Finally, the baby was born. Here is the wording on the birth announcement. Her Royal Highness, the Duchess of Cambridge, was safely delivered of a son. You notice the cadence of that? Was safely delivered of a son. At 4.24 p.m., the baby weighs 8 pounds, 6 ounces. Her Royal Highness and her child are both doing well. A baby was born. That's the birth announcement. But many, many, many years before that, another baby was born. And here's what the scripture says about that baby. And she shall bring forth a son. And thou shalt call his name, what? Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins. Through the birth of Christ, God fulfilled his promise to save us from our sins. For we cannot save ourselves. No matter how good we are, we do not, it doesn't matter how much we know. Or it doesn't even matter what people think about us. If we could have saved ourselves, then Jesus would not need to come. Christ came to save us, for we cannot save ourselves. Christ comes to save us from the power and the penalty of sin. I want to say that again. Christ came to save us from the power. Say power. And from the penalty of sin. That's what he came to save us from. So that sin would not any longer have power over us. He came to save us from the power and from the penalty of sin. But we cannot save ourselves. That's why Matthew says the woman would have a son. The son's name would be called Jesus. For it says Jesus who saves us from our sins. You know, the challenge of all, and I want you to hear me very clearly now. The challenge of all major world religion is that of salvation by works. The idea that salvation can be brought by our good works. That's the challenge of all major world religion. In traditional Catholicism, this is achieved through penance. In Islam, it is achieved through charity and pilgrimage to Mecca. That becomes the works of salvation. In Hinduism, 
There are four ways to salvation. They talk about the way of action, the way of knowledge, the way of devotion, and the royal road. All four ways involve human works for salvation. Even in Buddhism, it also involves human works for salvation. They have what they call the eightfold path. Right understanding, right resolve, right speech, right action, right occupation, right effort, right contemplation, right meditation. That if you do all these things right, then you get salvation. All major world religion. Christianity alone is consistent in defining that salvation is not achievable by human good works. But by grace through faith in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That's what Christianity believes. That we cannot save ourselves. We can't work for salvation. You can't crawl on your hands and knees until they are bloody to get to heaven. And because of that, Jesus saves you. You can't be nailed to a cross for your own sins. You can't give away enough money for God to save you. Christianity alone believes that we are saved by grace through faith. In the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Yet, and I want you to get this now. Even in Christianity, even amongst Christians today, there is still a disbelief in the clear word of God. So that while over and over and over again, the Apostle Paul, one of the authors of the New Testament, who wrote most of the books of the New Testament, the Apostle Paul clearly seeks to reveal that salvation is by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Yet back then, and even today, people continue to try to be saved, not by grace through faith, but by human works. But works can save. <coughs> like the rich young ruler. If you read in scriptures, there's a story of the rich young ruler. We all are like that rich young ruler. You know, we run up to Jesus. Just picture this guy. He saw Jesus coming. And this rich, young, Jewish ruler. He was born with uh, uh, many of the, the amenities, the finer amenities of his society. But he had a desire. He realized that something wasn't right. You know, I'm blessed with all that God has given me. But something isn't right. So he saw Jesus coming one day. And the Bible says he ran up to Jesus. Just picture him. Excited. He saw Jesus. And he said, good master. What must I do to be saved? What did he ask? What must I what? Do to be saved. But I'm here to tell you this evening that that is the wrong question. And many of us as Christians ask that question. What must I do to be saved? The question, the question, the right question is not what must I do. The right question is who must I be to be saved? And that's why in fact if you look carefully at it. You know, we are created, God created us human beings. He didn't create us human doings. God is not asking us to do things in order to be saved. He's asking us to be. Who must we be in order to be saved? For salvation is not attained by what we do, but salvation is attained by who we are. Who are we? Who are you? So that over and over again, the Apostle Paul seeks to make it clear to us that it is who we are in Christ that determines our salvation. Not what we do. Our works don't contribute to salvation. Our works cannot help us. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8 and verse 9, one of the key texts of scriptures. Ephesians says, for by what? Grace are we what? Saved through faith. For by grace are we saved through faith. Isn't that clear? 
It didn't say for by works are we saved through faith. It says for by grace are we saved through faith. Won't you say amen? And not of ourselves. It is the gift of God. Not of works. Lest any man should boast. You know, we live in a world where people like to boast about their riches. And every year, every year, uh, Forbes produces a list of the richest men in the world. The guy over in Mexico, Carlos Slim, you know, one of the richest men in the world. There are a couple of people in the United States who are amongst the richest people in the world. Is there anybody here this evening who would make that list? Just raise your hand. <laughs> By the grace of God. <laughs> If you claim all the riches of heaven, you can make that list. But we can't, regardless of how much money we have, pay for God's salvation. <laughs> we can't, regardless of how good we are, work for God's salvation. The text is consistently clear that we are saved by grace through faith. No man can take personal credit. You didn't earn it. You didn't deserve it. It's not by your goodness, for you can't be good enough. All of salvation is the work of Jesus Christ for man, not the work of man for Christ. Salvation is the grace of God at work in your heart. Grace is God's free gift to all of us. It is God's what? Free gift to all of us. Grace is what we call unmerited favor. You didn't deserve it, but God gave it to us nevertheless. If we deserved it, then it's a wage. And the Bible doesn't call it a wage. The Bible calls it a gift. For God gives it to us, even though we aren't good enough to earn it. God gives it to us, even though we aren't rich enough to pay for it. God gives it to us, even though we didn't work to deserve it. It's a gift. It is God doing something for us that we don't deserve. God loves us, though as sinners, we don't deserve it. He forgives us, though we don't deserve it. He saves and keeps us, even though we don't deserve or merit His salvation. That's grace, and that's why none of us can boast. It is not our appetite, what we eat and don't eat, that saves us. Even though God wants us to take care of what we eat. It is not... Which day we go to church, that saves us. Even though God has clearly given us a day that he wants us to worship him on. It is not any of those things. It is not whether or not we are faithful in bringing an offering to give God. Even though God commands us to bring an offering. But that still doesn't save us. Even if you were to give away your last kidney. To help somebody who needs a kidney. That still wouldn't mean that you could be saved. We are simply saved by the grace of God. By the grace of God. And that's why we can't boast. We can't say, I am better off than you. Because we are all sinners at the foot of the cross. Simply saved by grace. Won't you say amen? Amen. amen. And so, as we talk about salvation. Salvation is consisted of three parts. All right? There's what we call what? Justification. And the next one is? Sanctification. And the next one is? Glorification. Now, I remember when I was a kid. And, you know, we were in church. And we had Bible studies sometimes. And when, once those elders got up and they started to talk about justification and sanctification and glory. You know, my ears just closed because they, like, they were like talking over my head. So what I've decided to do is to break it down for you. Is that all right? So we can understand these terminologies. So we can break it down and it can become very clear to us. Justification is God's forgiveness of our past sins. So that we did some sin yesterday and the day before that. In fact, the Bible says we all were born in sin, shapen in iniquity. Let me put it this way. Nobody had to teach us how to lie. Am I right? Nobody has to teach us how to lie. It happens naturally because we are born in sin. 
We lie without even thinking about it because we are born in sin. So God's justification for us is for all of our past sins. He forgives us and declares us righteous. Justification means God's God treats you as if you had never sinned. <laughs> he treats us as if we had never done anything wrong in our life. That's how he treats us. The text says, the text says, Romans chapter 3, 24 and 25. It says what? Being justified freely to do what? To declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past. That's what the text says. And here's what it says in another translation of the Bible. So that's what it reads in the King James Version. Being justified freely. God freely declares us righteous. God freely treats us as if we had never sinned. Right? To declare his righteousness for the forgiveness of sins that are past. That's justification. For all of the sins that we committed 10 years ago, 5 years ago, 5 minutes ago. God declares us righteous as if we had never sinned. Here it is in uh, another version. It says, God in his grace freely makes us right in his sight. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty for our sins. For God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sins. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life shedding his blood for our sins. I like that last part. Let's read it again. It says people are made what? Right with God when they do what? Believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. So here it is, beloved. If you believe that Jesus Christ was nailed to the cross, gave his life, died for you, if you believe that and accept it by faith, then you can be covered by his righteousness. And when he covers you with his righteousness, he extends to you justification for all of your past sins. He don't count it against you. He wipes the slate clean. Wipes the slate clean. And that's why when he says forgiveness, I don't know if you've ever heard the story of this guy who was in a hospital, sick, very sick. And he, he, he was over there reading the Bible. And as he read the Bible, every now and again he would say, Hallelujah! Praise the Lord. And he kept declaring God's goodness as he would proclaim, Amen! Thank you, Jesus. And finally, the doctors and the nurses got a little tired. You know, maybe he was keeping up some of the other folks. They couldn't sleep. So they came and they took from him the Bible. And they gave him a geography book. A national geography. They gave him a copy. Say, you go read this and see if you can find something to, to praise the Lord over. So he got this book and he was quiet. And they said, yes, we got him now. And they were so excited. And they were getting ready to sleep. And all was peace and quiet. And just as they were ready to get into the REM phase of sleep, they heard the loudest hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Praise the Lord. And they ran over to find out what in, a, in, in, in national geography could cause this guy to have given even a louder amen than he gave in the Bible. And when they came over and asked him, what is it? He said, here, look in the National Geographic book. It talks about the depth of the sea. And it says that the deepest part of the ocean is seven miles deep. And when I read in the Bible, it says that God cast my sins into the depths of the sea. So if he cast it seven miles deep, it means that all of my past sins he has forgiven. And I can stand before him justified. Justified. So beloved, when God forgives you, he don't count it against you. When God forgives you, he don't treat you. You know, sometimes people look at us and they know stuff about us. 
I mean, they see us coming. You may even dress well, look nice. You may even look sharp. But all they can think of is something that they saw you do wrong one time. And so just like in the Bible, we talk about the woman caught in adultery. Poor woman. You know, God forgave her. And yet today we still talk about the woman caught in adultery. People who have done things in their past lives and God has forgiven them. But when we see them, that's all we can remember. But Jesus, when he sees you, he sees a son of God. Jesus, when he sees you, he sees a daughter of God. And so, beloved, he forgives us and declares us righteous. I say, praise the Lord. When we are converted and confess our sins to God, he forgives us and declares us justified. He treats us as if we have never sinned. So justification... Is declaring the repentant sinner just and righteous and delivering him or her from the what? Penalty of sin. From the penalty of sin. You, you want to get a, 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 an idea of how that works? There was Jesus nailed to the cross. Nailed to the cross. The crowds were mocking him. If you are truly the son of God, why don't you get off the cross and come down? Why don't you deliver yourself from off the cross? There were two men that were, that were crucified on either side of him. These two men were hardened criminals, gangsters, thieves. That's who they were. And one of them was joining with the crowd mocking Jesus. But the other one, the Holy Spirit came down on him touched his heart and said, look at where you are. You're about to die. This is no time to join in with the world and to mock Jesus Christ. This is a time to ask for the forgiveness of your sins. And so that thief, while he was nailed to the cross, that thief said to Jesus, Jesus, when you get to your kingdom, won't you remember me? This is a thief, a hardened criminal. He was on death row. In fact, he was being executed. They are taking him off death row. But while the, the, the guillotine was about to fall and he was about to die, he cried out to Jesus. And Jesus forgave him of his sins. Jesus says, you will be with me in paradise. Jesus treated him a hardened criminal. Jesus treated him a man who perhaps would kill his very mother to steal from her. Jesus treated him as if he had never sinned. And that's what he will do for us. That is justification. He declared him justified because of his faith. Because of his faith. He testified a faith in Jesus. Jesus, when you get to your kingdom, won't you remember me? Won't you raise your hand if that's what you want to say to Jesus tonight? Jesus, won't you remember me? Won't you remember me? Praise the Lord. And so Jesus said, like he's saying to all of us, I tell you today. You what? Will be with me. There's no if. There's no might be with me. There's no maybe I will remember you. He says you will be with me. Can you imagine when we get to the kingdom? And we're running around looking for perhaps uh, uh, Abraham. Perhaps Adam. Perhaps David and Daniel. Well some of us will be looking for that thief. A thief, now saved by grace, who will be with Jesus in paradise, saying, your testimony, because of your belief in Jesus Christ, that's what brought me here as well. Praise the Lord. Won't you say amen? Amen. amen. So we move on. So that's justification. Well, what is sanctification? Here it is. Sanctification is what? It is what? Victorious living. And it is victorious living that delivers us, how often? Daily. Daily. From the power of sin. From the power of sin. And let me tell you, beloved, sin has power. But sin's power is nothing compared to Jesus who is omnipotent. Which means he is all-powerful. Sin's power pales in significance to Jesus' power. So though sin may have power over us, and some of us, there are things that we know we shouldn't do, 
but we keep doing it. That's sin's power. There are some words we shouldn't speak, but we keep speaking it. That's sin's power. There are some behaviors we shouldn't practice, but we keep practicing it. That's sin's power. Well, sanctification gives us victory daily over sin's power. And here's, as we understand sanctification, when we spend time daily reading the word of God, when we spend time daily praying to God, when we spend time daily meditating on the grace and the goodness of God, how he died for us and was resurrected and is not and is now our intercessor before God, the Father in heaven. Just as you're thinking about that, just thinking about God's goodness. You know, I go for walks sometimes, or sometimes even when I'm at home, I may be shaving, or I may be getting ready. You know, I have my iPad, or sometimes I use my phone. I have this Bible app that I just let the Bible just, it just reads the Bible to me. So I'm listening to it. As it reads the Bible to me. And I'm telling you, beloved, as you are reading or listening to the word of God, God's word is so powerful that the word alone, as you're listening to it or reading, is just cleaning you up. It's just taking away some of the bad habits you have. It is just rerouting your thought pattern so that you don't think like you used to think before. Now you're thinking like somebody who knows Jesus Christ. So that when you spend time with God, he sanctifies you. Cleans you up. Gives you victory and power over sin. Frees us from the bondage and the chains of addictive and sinful habits. And so we are freed from the power of negative and selfish behaviors. From addiction to drugs and, and alcohol and porn. In sanctification, we don't look to truth as a list of do's and don'ts. I want you to hear me now. We're talking about sanctification. We don't see truth as a list of do's. And don'ts. Are you with me? We instead look to Jesus. We look at his life. We interpret truth through the life of Jesus Christ. I want you to get that. I want you to get that. Even for an illustration for that, think about politics. One of the things that we often hear in politics is the Constitution. You know, this constitution was written years ago by some people, right? Now, it would be nice if they were still alive, so that when we have issues with the constitution, we could ask them, what did you mean? Because maybe they use words that we don't even use anymore. Some of those words have fallen out of style. So today, what they have is the Supreme Court. So when there are constitutional issues, we go to the Supreme Court to decide what the Constitution means. But I'm so excited, beloved, that when we have context that we are trying to determine what is truth, we don't need to go to the Supreme Court. We can go to Jesus. We can look at the life of Jesus. How did Jesus behave? How did he worship? How did he treat other people? That is truth. Some of us believe truth is just some words. But truth is not just words. Truth is Jesus. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. And that word is Jesus Christ himself. So if you want to be sanctified, we need to steep ourselves in the word, but not in the word as if it's just ordinary Shakespearean word, but in the word as it is revealed in the life of Jesus Christ. We need to get to know him. Too many people read the Bible for information. We are not here just seeking information. What we are about is seeking transformation, for only Jesus can transform our lives. That's what he does. That's what he does. So we spend time with him. We look to him. He is the way. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. That's what he is. So when we spend time with him, who is truth, he cleans up our mess. Won't you say amen? Just say thank you, Jesus. He cleans up our mess, giving us victory in our lives over sin over our habits, and over the challenges that we face. Amen. And so that's sanctification. Sanctification is a process of growing to become more like Jesus. You know, 
And, and that's why even people who are new to Christianity and you have accepted Jesus Christ recently as your Lord and Savior from sin, the Bible calls you a spiritual babe. But a baby that is growing. Unfortunately, sometimes some people don't grow. You know, they're a baby all of their lives. They behave like babies. They act like babies. Spiritual babies all of their lives. But in Jesus Christ, we ought to be growing. And I don't expect a newborn baby to be behaving the same way as somebody who has come to Christ for many, many years. Because there is room to grow. Every day is sweeter with Jesus than the day before. Every day I love him more and more. Every day we ought to be growing in a love relationship with Jesus Christ as he sanctifies us and we grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Don't you want to grow to become more like Jesus? Don't you want to experience the joy of knowing that your heart is linked with his heart? And that what you do is what Jesus would do. And you can say, thank you, Jesus, for keeping me safe today. That is growth. And in sanctification, God expects us to grow. He expects us to grow. We talk about glorification. That's the third phase. And we talk about salvation and righteousness by faith. Glorification. And in John, in, 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 in Revelation chapter 21, one of my favorite chapters in the Bible in Revelation chapter 21, the scripture says, I look at that quickly. It says, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. The church is prepared as a bride, adorned. Can you imagine a bride? Well decked out, beautiful, pure, ready for her husband. That's the description of the church. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, God is now dwelling with men. The tabernacle of God is with men. He will dwell with them and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, no more sorrow, no more pain and crying, for the former things are passed away. Beloved, glorification is the experience that the saints are looking forward to when as we enter the new Jerusalem, as we enter God's eternal kingdom, that we will be delivered, not now just from the power of sin, we will be delivered from the presence of sin. Won't you say amen? No more sin. No more sin. No more. I don't know about you, beloved, but sin has done a number on us. I mean, it was just yesterday... I could play soccer for two hours and not be tired. It was just yesterday I didn't need these things on my face. It was just yesterday I thought I was invincible. But as we get older, <laughs> you know, and my sons, sometimes I, I, I remember looking at my dad and I used to think when I was a kid that my dad was old. Well, now that I'm thinking about it, I am older now than my dad was when I thought he was old. Sin has done a number on us. I remember as a pastor, there were days I used to go to visit in the hospitals. When I get there, I'm looking for a member. And I remember in those times, there were hospital rooms that had two or three people inside of those rooms. So I would go in and I'm looking for my member. And I know they're in the room because I got the names and I told me they're in the room. But I don't recognize them. And somebody would say, hold on, pastor. And they'd turn their back. And I realized they're taking off their wig or they're taking out their teeth. And when they put it back and put on their wig, now I know you. Because sin has done a number on us. We don't look like what we were born like. No more. We have done a number on us. But God has promised to deliver us from the power and the presence of sin. Won't you say amen? There'll be a day when we can see without these things again. There'll be a day when we will never be sick and tired again. There'll be a day when we will be healthy. When God will restore us. 
And we'll be able to say, thank you, Jesus. We can worship you through the ages of eternity. I don't know about you, beloved, but I'm looking forward to that day. I am I'm looking forward to that day. The Bible says, oh, John indeed saw the new Jerusalem. Can you just imagine what that will be like when in our glorified bodies, God will call us home to be with him. Delivered finally from the power and also from the presence of sin. No more sin. No more sin. And in fact, the Bible says, sin will not arise a second time. God is going to put an end to all of sin. I don't know, but I'm tired of wars. I'm tired of sicknesses. I am tired of diseases. I remember years ago, and I often share the story, I was standing at a prayer meeting, and there was a mom standing at the back with a little baby in her hand because the baby was crying. And I looked at the baby, and the baby looked at me, and I made a face at the baby, and she smiled and laughed at me. The next day, I was in a meeting, and I got a call that the baby had just died, that same baby. Just died from sudden infant death syndrome. Just like that. Just like that. That's the world in which we live. And if you aren't tired of it, beloved, aren't you tired of it? Aren't you tired of it? Tired of losing our loved ones. Tired of the doctors. Tired of the hospitals. Tired of uh, a secure, the security issues that we face in our world. Tired of drug abuse. Tired of broken homes. Tired of broken marriages. Tired of this world. But Jesus is coming to put an end to this world and to... Invite us to experience the glorification of his eternal kingdom. Praise God, I want to be there. And so the question is, beloved, what must I do to receive justification or forgiveness for past sins? The text says, if we do what? Confess, for we're all sinners. If we confess our sins, he is? Say faithful. Say faithful. Jesus is faithful. He don't make a promise he don't keep. He is faithful to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He is faithful. Confession is to admit that you realize that what you did was wrong. That's the word. That's what confession is. Lord, I realize what I did was wrong. I confess. Confession is to realize that what we did was wrong. Lord, all this time, I have been a cheat and a liar. All this time, I have been a person with an unforgiving spirit. All this time, I have been a Sabbath breaker and have not loved you as I should by obeying your commandments. But I now confess my sins. Forgive me, Lord. When we understand the grace and the love of God, we will not seek to hide our sins from him, for we cannot hide from God. But we will make ourselves vulnerable to God. We will confess our sins and failings to him. And then we will lay hold on his mercy and his grace. And the God we serve, he will forgive us. So we are becoming more like Jesus. That is, we are becoming more holy. As we confess our sins. And now we are beginning to grow in Jesus Christ. He forgives us. He treats us as if we have never sinned. But each day is a new day to walk with him again. Yesterday's victories is not for today. Yesterday is past. And so, beloved, even though we did well yesterday growing in Jesus, but we have to get up today and say, Jesus, it's a new day. I want to walk with you one more time. Each day. And so, we become holy like he's holy. We become righteous like he's righteous. Sanctification is the process of transforming us once again into the image of God. We were created in, in his image at creation. The devil came and defaced. It's like he went and took his own markings and marked it all over us. But Jesus is shining, shining us up again. He's cleaning off the defacement. He's cleaning away the sin. He says, I want to see myself in you one more time. That's what he wants to do. And so Thessalonians says that everyone should know, every one of you should know how to do what? Possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. What's his vessel? Possess his vessel. Possess our bodies 
in sanctification and honor. That even being sanctified relates to how we live our lives, how we eat, how we drink, how we walk, how we talk, what we say, how we treat others, how pure we are, what we watch. Pornography is one of the big challenges of our days. And you know, one of the things that I've learned as a young Christian growing up, never even to become curious. Because the devil uses your curiosity to trap you. He says, take one look. Everybody is doing it. And it's one look, and then you're hooked. But I am thankful, beloved, that God says we should possess our bodies. Every part of our bodies. Every part. Our eyes, our ears, our mouths, our feet, our hands. Every part of our bodies should be surrendered to Jesus Christ. And then we grow to become more like Him in sanctification. How long does it take to become sanctified? It's a work of a lifetime. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the statue of the fullness of Christ. We don't get there overnight. But we get there by walking a little bit every day with Jesus. One day at a time, sweet Jesus. That all I'm asking from you. Every day a little more. Every day more like him. And as we keep walking with Jesus every day, we get closer to him. Till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. Beloved, aren't you, are you walking with him this evening? Growing to become like him. Walking in a direction that is taking us closer and closer to Jesus. Another text says what? Sanctify them through what? Through thy truth. Thy word is truth. And as I said before, we ought to spend time in the word of God. Like you're doing here this evening. While you are here this evening. And we have opened up the word. Reading the word of God. God is doing a process of sanctifying you. While we read the word. Won't you say amen. amen. Working in us. Cleaning us up. Giving us different desires. Giving us different desires. I've seen some people when they accept Jesus Christ. They even walk differently. They talk differently. There's a light over their countenance. When you see them, you said something has changed on you. Because when you meet Jesus Christ and he cleans you up and the truth of God is doing a work in your heart that when God works on the inside, it shines out on the outside. You don't behave the same. You know, before I was a Christian, if you had treated me like that, this is how I would have done you. But now that I'm a Christian, all I can say is like water on duck's back. Because the God whom I serve has wrought a change in me. Won't you say amen? Praise the Lord. Amen. Beloved, God sending his own son that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled. Where? In us. That sanctification is Christ working in us. Won't you let God work in you? He wants to work in us. Through sanctification, we can say the things we used to do, we do them no more. The places we used to go, we go there no more. The words we used to speak, we speak them no more. What a change! What a change! The song says, it's a great change. It's a great change. I said, hallelujah. Amen. And amen. And so, we are conformed to the image of His Son. God is at work through us and through our faith and obedience in Christ. Each day He's bringing us to become more and more like Jesus. That we would walk like Him, talk like Him, pray like He prayed, be faithful like He is faithful. Growing in Christian maturity. We are not just falling in love with Jesus, but we are growing in love to become more and more like Jesus every day. Every day. Beloved, how hard it is for me sometimes to let Jesus rule my life. How hard is it? You know, there are some people, <laughs> there are some people who want to give their life to Christ. 
but they are afraid. I don't know if I can do it. But I'm here to tell you, it ain't you who's going to do it. It is he who will do it in you. And that's why, beloved, for new Christians, here is what you do. You don't have to grit your teeth not to sin. Like, I'm not going to tell him off today. No, you don't have to do that. What you have to do is grit your teeth to hold on to Jesus. I'm not going to let go of him today. If you hold on to him, he does it for you. <laughs> That's what he does. Because it's not you doing it, it's him. Our responsibility is to keep holding on to Jesus. Just keep holding on to him. Don't let go. You know the story of, 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 of Jacob who was wrestling with an angel one night. Wrestling, he thought he was wrestling with a man. But when he realized he was not wrestling with man, he was wrestling with God himself. He changed from wrestling to hanging on. And that what we have to do is to hold on to Jesus and not let him go. I'm not going to let you go, Lord. I'm not going to let you go. You're going to bless me. I got some challenges in my life, but I'm going to hold on till you bless me. I have some problems in my life, but I'm going to hold on till you bless me. I have some behaviors that I need to let go, some habits that are not good for me, but I'm going to hold on till you give me victory over those habits. The Christian life is about holding on to Jesus Christ. Let nothing stand between you and your relationship with Jesus. There is nothing on earth that is as valuable as your salvation and your relationship with Jesus Christ. I'm going to say that again. There is nothing on earth, not your husband, not your boyfriend, not your girlfriend, not your spouse, not your children, not your money, not your job. There is nothing on earth that is as valuable as your relationship with Jesus Christ. And that's why if your right hand offend you. And that's not to be taken literally. It's, it's, it's almost a parable. What the Bible is saying is that nothing. How important is the right hand to you? You know, especially if you're not an ambidextrous person. Your right hand. It's very important to you. And if you, if you are prepared to cut off even your right hand, it shows you how important salvation and Jesus Christ must be to you. Too many people are holding on to nothing. God is inviting you to open your heart and open your hands. Release the nothing that you're holding on to. So that he can give you eternal life. So that he can give you his eternal kingdom. So he can give you the treasures of heaven and eternity. That's what he wants to give us. But many of us are holding on to nothing. We prefer nothing. Nothing. <laughs> Solomon calls it <laughs> vanity. He says it's nothing. It's like we're holding on to the wind. When Jesus wants to give us the riches of his kingdom. He who overcomes... The text says, shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot his name from the book of life. But I will confess his name before my father. Won't you say amen? Amen. amen. And here's one of my favorite texts coming up. Can I be sure of salvation once I accept Jesus? Philippians 4 is a powerful text. Philippians 1 verse 6. It says, being confident... You know what confidence means? You can take it to the bank. Being confident of this very thing. That he which hath done what? Begun a good work in you. Will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. If you let Jesus start with you. And you keep hanging on to him. He will keep you until he comes again. Nothing shall separate us from the love of God. Not even money, not bank, not, not treasures, not, not the enemy, not the devil himself. If we hold on to Jesus, nothing can prevent him from saving us. But we have to keep holding on to him. You can't, but Jesus can. The text says, another text from Philippians. Philippians like these texts. He says in Philippians 4 and verse 13, I can do all things, but I can only do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's what he wants to do to you. So be confident. The assurance of salvation is in the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. 
He will never let you down. He will never let you down. And so, beloved, for it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. It is God who is working in you. And so some people think being a Christian is too hard. They believe they cannot overcome their sinful habits. But beloved, it is not about fighting against sinful habit. It's about fighting to love Jesus more and more every day. It's about fighting to spend some more time in prayer every day. It's about fighting to take some time read the scriptures every day. For when you spend time with God, when you spend time with Jesus, you become like Jesus. You allow him to work in you a change of habit and heart and life. Even while you are here this evening, God is doing his work in you right now. Won't you say what a wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Lord? Yes, he is at work in all of us. He is at work in all of us. Won't you say amen? We're going to close right now. I'm going to give you two few minutes just to do some table work right now. My understanding of righteousness by faith. Just talk to each other around your table for a brief moment. And explain to each other, what is your understanding of righteousness by faith? Just, just take a moment to discuss that. What is your understanding of righteousness by faith? How do you understand righteousness by faith? As much as you're at your table, make it a dialogue so that you know everyone gets a chance. We won't be here too long. Another 30 seconds for the discussion. Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. All right? I hope as you've reflected on it, what to you is righteousness by faith? That you're just awed by God's love for you. That you're just amazed by his grace towards you. That you're just impressed by his love for you. And to all of us who are awed and amazed and impressed by the love of God, as he affirms to us how much he loves us as he affirms to us that he cares for us. The scripture that I'm reminded of, he says to all of us, come unto me, all you who labor, laboring for our salvation, and we're heavy laden and burdened trying to work for our salvation. He says, come, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, for my yoke is easy. And my burden is light. Won't you do that swap with him? If you do that this evening, won't you just take your decision for Christ's card one more time? I know you have used it a number of times. But I pray that as you use it this evening, that indeed you are truly ready to make a positive decision 
for Jesus Christ. Let's quickly do that. We'll be finished in another minute. I will pray for you, and you'll be able to go. Let's quickly fill out these cards. Need a pen there on the table, some cards there by the table. Just take a brief moment. This, this is important because this is your affirmation, not to me, but to Christ. It's like you're sealing that with your own handwriting that I truly want to let Jesus know how I feel about him. If you feel positive to Jesus, you will be prepared to respond, to show him how you feel about him. We're about to pray now. We're about to pray, and as we get ready to pray, I want to just give you an opportunity to let God know how you feel this evening. So as I pray for you, as I pray for you, if you are, in addition to doing your cards, you want to say, include me in that prayer very specially that I would give my whole heart and life to Jesus Christ, that I would believe in his salvation by faith. And you want to claim that this evening as I pray. Just raise your hand as I get ready to pray. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Father, in the name of Jesus, we believe that you died for us. We claim that you died for us. We thank you, Lord, for dying for us. And now, as we believe that, we confess that we are sinners and we ask for your forgiveness, that you would cleanse us, for you are faithful and you have promised that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We thank you, Lord, for knowing that we can't save ourselves, but you can save us and that there is no sin that we have committed, that if we don't confess it, you would not be able to save us. So we say, Lord, forgive us, please, for whatever it is. Forgive us, please. And that when we leave here tonight, go with us. Don't let us go home alone, Lord. Go with us. May your Holy Spirit be in our beds with us tonight to remind us of how much you love us and how much you care for us so that we would be surrendered, not just here, but even at home, we would continue the act of surrendering to your will. Then bring us back tomorrow night. We have a prayer session that we would pray and receive more of your power in our lives. Bring us back tomorrow evening, Lord, so that we would hear more words from you and we would be increased in our commitments to you. Then finally, Lord, one day when you come and we will be glorified to meet in your eternal kingdom where there will be no more sin, no more shame, no more pain, and no more death. Lord, we say, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. We pray in your precious name. Let everyone say amen. 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 Thank you. God bless you. Bring a friend tomorrow. God bless you as you go this evening. Amen.